Yo, have we ever met in person? I think I don't, I don't think so. I think we may have shaken hands at a. I didn't think so either, but, but we, this is the longest we've ever spoke. Right now, in this four seconds. <laughs> <That's> it. <laughs> I, because uh, obviously I know a whole lot about you, and in, in this town, especially when it's award season, you just never know who you run into or say hi to quickly. Right. Yes. And so it is a real treat to talk to you. I'm oh, big, likewise. big fan. I, you know, just to go back a little bit, we had Chad Kroger on because I'm, I'm, I love Nickelback and have and. Um, Love your music that you did with them. But Chad was on, and I was like, hey, what's up? I didn't realize you're Joey. Yes. <laughs> and it, uh, what was on Joey's head? I didn't realize that was you. That was me. Yeah. That, to me, of everything is the most – because that, that that line is such a staple of, like, my early 20s. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I asked him about it. I was like, hey, so what was on Joey's head? And he went on this thing, and that's when it was, oh, that's Joey here. Yeah. yeah. So – I, I just want to start with that line and that song. I, I would imagine you never thought in a million years that would become, it's a meme now, yeah. but it's all over the place. When you heard the line, were you like, I don't know, Chad? Not, not at all, to be honest, because he had written that song. He'd come off the road and he had written the verse. He'd probably written a seven-minute verse of that song with all that imagery. And he'd started, that was a... Man, that was probably New Year's 2005 when we took that picture. Something like that, long time ago when we took that picture. And uh, uh, the picture is hilarious because our eyes are completely blistering red and we're having the best time of our life. Um, and uh, it was a champagne chiller. And when you turn it upside down, it looks like the Stanley Cup, like a little miniature Stanley Cup. So I don't know if he told you the story. He, he did, but it's always interesting to hear another version of the same story yeah so so i'm listening because that's the picture's the one he holds up though in the video right yes, correct yeah. and so why did you have it on your head though because like any good drunk canadian when you see something that looks like the stanley cup you, you go just, right to the head just go straight up yeah. and hoist it and, <laughs> <laughs> and then for some reason it ended up upside down on my head and someone snapped the picture it was all just like cosmic timing <laughs> how many times a week do you get asked that question about what was on joey's head it used to be, uh, like, when the song was big and probably for about six, seven years, it would be, like, I was running from that question. <laughs> like, I, I had had a lot of it. Um, but honestly, over the last, since I've been here, no, no one really asked me about it. Like, it's just recently with the new music coming out that they're doing that uh, people are asking me again. <laughs> are people mind blown when they figure out it is you and that song and that line? Sometimes, known forever? Because yeah. I was. I was like, oh, my God. Yeah. Like the, it's like the biggest, craziest thing. I was like, that's Joey. He's coming yeah. in here. That's so yeah. famous. Yeah. Uh, well, I, again, super pumped that you're here. You've been such, you know, a, a pivotal, such a pivotal part of of just music in general, pop, country for the past 25, 30 years or so. Um, when you moved to Nashville, how old were you? Um, I think I was 32, 33. And why? Why? Like, why did you come here? Um, Lean a little closer to that mic. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you're good. Um, you know, it was you, rock music at that time was pop music, and it kind of just became not pop music. We had, you know, Kanye was making huge records, and Justin Timberlake was making huge records, and Katy Perry and Max Martin, and the, the Max Martin and Dr. Luke era kind of took over in top 40. So that guitar based, melodic guitar based rock was no longer pop music. So it was definitely, we were all kind of looking at a different future at that point and um you know my my course had run with nickelback with those guys working with them and um, i kind of cleaned up all my my rock and roll loose ends all the records i was working on i kind of finished up and uh, myself and a day one guy for me who's a canadian country artist named dallas smith um he was in a rock band at the same at the same time and uh you know, his course had kind of run with that group, and he texted me one night, and he's like, you, you want to go make a country record? And we had threatened each other with making a country record on him, man, probably 10 years prior to that. And, um, yeah, finally he texted me out of the blue, and I was like, yep, I'm, I'm in. I'm ready to go. At that point, I was becoming a songwriter, and uh, Nashville was a logical step for me to come down and just sort of continue that university of becoming a, a better songwriter. Um, so my manager at the time booked us a trip through Nashville, <clears throat> on my first day here, I met my current business partners. Um, I first met, day? First day here, I wrote with uh, a handful of guys at Big Loud, and I met Craig, and I met Seth England. Seth was 
had just been had just been assigned his job as creative manager there from intern like he was 22 23 um and uh i fell in love with the place right away dallas and i spent a week writing his first first country record so and we kind of got to hit a lot of great writers we had craig wiseman we had rodney claus and chris tompkins tom douglas and geez danny orton and jen shaw like all these great country writers and um we came down for a week had a blast um i hit it off with craig and seth at that time i was doing a lot of artist development um on the rock and roll side like just signing you know, young kids to production deals and connecting the dots with songwriters and then making a product and then going and selling it to a record company and then fingers crossed we get to make that record or if not we move on to the next thing um so i sort of had that element and they wanted to do that as well and they had the songwriting side of things so we were just a great marriage and we all was dallas in default yes yeah that makes sense very first kid that i ever recorded that got on the radio really yeah very 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 first default or default yeah or however you say it i i I worked you know i've worked in every format from pop to rock to hip-hop but i used to play we used to play that default or default song what was it wasted my time wasting my time wasted yeah Yeah, that's right (laughs) you remember that one mike i remember that song it was a big song that was a big it was a big one everywhere yeah Yeah. that was that was awesome so what is what, what was his sto- what was Dallas's story? I know he's still making country music, but I don't. Yep. Has he tr- has he really put an effort into the states to try to make it? Because I know he's really good. He's great. He, I mean, he's household name in Canada, um, and we keep running him up the charts up there. Are you guys still uh, cool? I asked that question. You and Dallas. Oh good? yeah, totally. Okay, I'm, cool. I'm currently making a record on him right now. Great. Um, uh, and a dear friend, like a day one kid for me. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean. He, his family's in Vancouver. He lives in Vancouver. Uh, that's where he's committed to work and, and stay. Um, he comes down here frequently. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, he's not a songwriter. And so it's easier when you are a songwriter to come and immerse yourself in Nashville and to have that look in the U.S. So um, really we're just banking on a great outside song to come in. And, and you never know. It's the power of a song. Yeah, he's really good. He's really good. I mean, his voice is second to none it's one of those guys where you go well maybe it hasn't happened here quite yet but eventually it will just based on how good he is yeah yeah um when you come to nashville you mentioned a lot of things you say you know you had this skill set and they had this need for that skill set and so you came in so you didn't just come here and go i'm going to start producing folks you came here with a bigger business uh just kind of an attitude you're going to do more than just sit in the studio yeah i was always pretty entrepreneurial uh, I knew there I needed certain pieces to to move forward, and it was really in the song world. I wanted to become a better songwriter, um, and I knew just I had to associate myself with great songwriters and, and do it regularly. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I, I mean, what happened to my songwriting career is vanished because production career just took right off. And I, it's hard to focus in on both, which is totally fine because uh, uh, we ended up signing a bunch of great songwriters. That, yeah, that, that, that and that's kind of more fun to empower, anyways. Well, how do you study in school? Meaning, do you go, okay, I like music because I know you sing. You did. I mean, I, I know you did. You know, you sang. Even I have some background tracks that you've done yeah. before that are pretty distinct. So obviously, you had this skill set in music. But how do you end up going into the production side of it? And why did you choose that path? Um, honestly, I got started. I, I really was into. I started as a recording engineer. And I was really into the technology side of things. And then I started working as a recording engineer. And then, you know, if you're not happy making 15 punk rock songs in a day and tracking them and mixing them and doing vocals on them and getting them done in a day, you know, you'd really need to start taking control of the music. <laughs> so I did that for a few years and, and just naturally... But how do you even know that's a thing? Like I, where I come from, we wouldn't know there was such things as a recording engineer. Where did you live, and did, were there studios around? Like, how were you exposed to even know that there was a person that recorded and was over that? My guidance counselor in high school thought uh, he originally uh, sent me to a radio station in Fort St. John, British Columbia, uh, 560 CKNL, a little AM station up there, and I got to go. I thought I wanted to work in radio, and then they kind of put me everywhere. Um, I'd sit with the morning guy, and then after that, they'd put me in the, they called it the production room, and they had me, it was old reel-to-reel back then, 
so they had me cutting all the reel to reels and editing the song list and i, I kind of really took to the technology side of it all mm -hmm. um <clears throat> and that was kind of the report that the the i guess it was the program director at the time reported back to my guidance counselor so then my guidance counselor was like well let's try a recording studio so then he sent me down to vancouver um which uh uh, to a man it was a studio called bullfrog studios and they did a, a work experience thing um, for schools and i went down there for three four weeks and um got to push the buttons a little and, and figure out what it was and then i kind of decided that that was my path i was kind of always into music and i was always into the technology side i was always the dj at the high school dance and setting up the pa i was that kid um and uh, it was just natural to end up going to i wasn't a great student like i i i technically haven't graduated high school and I'm still a science credit short but this private college <laughs> saw it in me and let me come down there and uh, uh, attend their school and I, I just really took to the uh, the technical side of things what is it like to have an education system that cares <laughs> <laughs> that's what I hear that you had a like a counselor that goes hey we're gonna help you okay that yeah. didn't work let me continue to yeah. invest my into yeah. you that's is that normal in Canada that they care I, and they try? I guess. I mean, uh, I, he knew I was such a bad student. Like, I was terrible at math and English and, she's my French classes, all that stuff. I was so bad. Um, but there were certain things I was really good at. I was really great at history, and I was really great, you know, if I was passionate and into it, um, I think I just kind of had a short attention span. It was hard for me on things I didn't like. But um, but he just recognized the things I was passionate about and pushed me push me there which i guess yeah. i've never you're the first person that's ever pointed that out so i mean i've never really thought of it i mean it's a pretty valuable moment in life you know yeah that he helped you and then once it wasn't there continued to help you yeah. and see it through that just wouldn't yeah. work. what's it like to have health care <laughs> like that's the part too where i'm like how do we not have health care here and we look at you guys and it's like you go to the doctor broken arm okay we're gonna fix that up for you may take a second yeah. waiting we'll fix it up uh here that'll be thirty one thousand dollars sir yeah. That is, that is it is wild. different. That took me a while to wrap my head around, and I, to know that I know people down here that don't have health care. I was like, "Wow, you go, you like if you broke your foot right now, you'd be in big trouble." Yeah, yeah. Well, just figure it out. And then also, it's cold. This is my final candidate because we're on a bunch of cities in Canada too. My morning show is right, and so it's cold a lot. Yeah. To where, when it's cold, when it's just cold, it probably feels pretty warm to you guys. It, yeah. it, how do you live in all the cold all the time? Well. Vancouver isn't as bad. Uh, Vancouver's pretty mild. A lot of a lot of the winters, it's it gets colder here in Nashville than it will be in Vancouver. You, you get all that weather, the wind coming up from the from Hawaii, mm. that basically that ends didn't... in Vancouver. Because Vancouver's like, I think of Vancouver as Seattle. Totally. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You're two uh, two and a half hours north, basically. Mm. And Vancouver just most of Canada's is directly on the border, right there. Um, so Vancouver stays. You might get snow a couple times a winter, maybe for about a week, week and a half. Man, that kills, that kills the romantic version of Canada that I have in my head. Well, you're thinking like, igloos all the time. Yeah, yeah. Every 7-Eleven's <laughs> built of ice. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's it. That's Saskatchewan. <laughs> Whenever you come to Nashville and you start to work with the Big Loud, was it Big Loud shirt when you first got here? Yeah, it was just the publishing company at the time. It was uh, Craig's company. Um, and uh, that's where I did my I just a real easy publishing deal with them. Mm -hmm. they, uh, Seth at the time was the song plugger. Seth England, who's my big partner, or Big Loud, my partner at Big Loud, and Craig Wiseman, who's my other partner, songwriter partner at uh, Big Loud as well. Um, Seth originally started booking my uh, co-writes for me, and uh, and they would just put me to work. Seth was booking them at like 23, 24 years old, booking them for you? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I don't, see, I just, Craig was here, but I had COVID the one time he came, so I, like last minute, I text Mike, and I was like, I got COVID, I can't come over, I'm not giving Craig COVID. Right. So I came over, and we we did the show, but I saw Craig at the CMAs mm -hmm. a few weeks ago, a couple weeks yep. ago, yep. and I went up, and I said, hey, Craig, I never I never, never met him, and I usually just stay to myself. I don't yeah. want to bother anybody, just generally in life. And we talked for a little bit, and he was obviously super nice, right? Just super yeah. lovely guy. Yeah. Especially when I met Craig. But And Seth and I have only seen each other in passing a few times. Usually it's because we're somewhere, and he's got somebody with him. And, but mm -hmm. I tell you the thing about Seth is every time that, most every time, that I have gotten any sort of pushback from this industry for anything that I am doing that is slightly different, and he can just, he just has some sense like Batman knows when I'm getting crushed. He'll send me a message and go like, "Yo, dude, hang in there." It's always people that that are are pushing the place in different ways. That, mm -hmm. that I mean, he always sends like like a really kind, yeah. inspirational message. And 
I'm telling you, I don't know if he maybe if my glasses were on, he probably knew who I was. But we haven't spent a whole lot of time together. Right. But he is like you is so instrumental in a big part of country music over the last ten years. What is he like? Seth, oh man, I'll say I knew um, within the first couple weeks of knowing those guys, I knew he was going to be a huge. He was a piece that somebody like me required. Um, I, I remember coming here and he'd be he was still doing going to all the writer rounds and he the standard the standard uh, creative manager evenings that they have to do and he would take me out um with him and i swear i would shake a hundred hands a night with him and i'd, I'd never had anybody come into my life that way who had, uh, was just in, opening the every door to the town for yeah. me, basically so he's one of those just natural connectors natural senior executive kid it was just He's just God. It's the easiest thing for him to do in his day. He's he's so gifted in that senior management role. Um, and Craig, you know, Craig's a scatterbrained songwriter, and I'm a scatterbrained producer. We need that one anchor who's creative and can follow through and make sure we're all on track. And that and that's him. He's truly gifted in that in that world. When you hop into a studio here for the first time, are you like, all right, well, we're about to start a whole new version of of what I'm doing sonically? Do you have that feeling, or are you just like, it's just another day? Uh, you mean like now? What, no, like Jay. Let's say Jay. I, I was looking at your credits, and the first thing that I saw that I recognized was Jay. You had a credit. I'm doing Barefoot Blue Jean Night. Yeah. Now you had been doing rock for the most part, and yeah. and this is your first credit. I'm sure you maybe worked on other stuff, but were you like, okay, well, it's time to do some country here. Let's see how yeah. this goes. I mean, is that kind of the feeling? Yeah, I was terrified, um, because we came the world I came from. You know, you're working with rock bands. There's usually one or two good musicians in the group and then the rest of the guys if they're playing on the record they're learning how to play their parts and it's a slower wow really yeah it's just a not slower a lot of process session, session players in rock no not at all you're you working with the band right that's that's the difference of rock and roll it's like this petri dish of whatever it is is in a small town somewhere in alberta and it grows into this thing and you you capture that and and, and build that where you know here's obviously different you have this songwriting factory and musician factory and all these huge giant tools in the toolbox to use but up there you don't so i was pretty terrified when i came down i didn't really understand the whole session life and um i remember wearing seth out I'm like i'm gonna need this much time and i don't know who these guys are and i'm gonna have to do this and this and then seth you know calmed me down he gave me two hours of overtime on my first session so i had five hours to get a whole song done which now we can get like four songs done in that much time <laughs> after being here but i was terrified and uh, I guess Craig had, or Seth had told Craig that I was freaking out about having to come in and cut this Jake music and having no frame of reference. So Craig basically grabbed me by the ear and took me down to one of his demo sessions. And he was like, okay, sit here, watch. And then I watched and I'm like, oh, I get this. Did because, you, find, you find it was easier or you find that you were just so ready for it? Um, I, it took me a while to fully embrace the Nashville tracking system. I didn't speak the language very well. I was used to just speaking to other musically illiterate people who just sang their ideas out, right? Where here, there's a kind of super defined language. It's really, they've simplified it down so you can communicate shorthand through a creative process, which is great. But it took me a while to learn that. Um, so it caused me to, the result was I sat in my studio and played as much as I could and programmed drums and did as much as I could myself. And then I would just bring guys in to the studio and work with them the old-fashioned way, the way I did in Vancouver. So I just have one guitar player sit with me, and we would just sing parts back and forth and figure out how to do it. Um, but now I feel like I'm, I always say, I'm trying to be 30% more Dan Huff uh, and be able to like you know read charts, which I can now. And it took me a while to figure out how to do that uh, and just speak more of the session player language. So. Um, and that came kind of by demand. The business grew enough, and I just had to make more music faster. And so I had to go embrace the, 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 tracking, the tracking room style of making records, which I absolutely love doing now. I can't believe it took me so long. It's so fun. And you learn, you kind of get to be a GM of a sports team at that point. You kind of figure out what lane you're going in, and then you cast the musicians appropriately for that, right? And so I have kind of have... To, three or four little crews that I put together for certain styles of music. Whenever these country artists come in, when you first get here, and my experience was, oh, they can all sing. Like, pretty much. I was surprised. Yeah. Because where I came from in pop, they couldn't. Yeah. And there were some that wouldn't want to be near a microphone and be asked to sing because 
you wouldn't want to ruin that. Right. Was, but again, you come from the rock world, which probably is a little more genuine than the pop world where everything is manufactured. Did you feel like these country guys consistently actually had a vocal talent that maybe sometimes you had to cover up when you were in the rock world at all? Um, you know, it's kind of situational. Um, for the most part, yes. Most of them are, are especially nowadays, um, in our world, we a lot of strong vocalists and strong songwriters. You know, um, early on, before we had proven our concept as a company, as a business, we, you know, the fruit wasn't as ripe when you mm. go pick it off the tree. So it required a little more uh, artist development and help at the time. But but now nowadays, everyone's coming in pretty pretty buttoned up, strong. What, what was the first big album that you worked on when you got here? They said this is the project. It was Jake. It was Jake. I did um, I did a song. My very first tracking session with him was a song uh, called Keeping It Country. Uh, and then that was kind of my audition in that world. And it, I owe a lot to Jake because Jake just thought the idea was cool. He's like, yeah, let's get this rock guy. And then we'll have the songwriter Rodney Kloss in there to keep it country, but we'll do something totally new. So Jake took kind of the big risk. Um, he was working with Tony Brown at the time, who if anyone – as aware of record producers, Tony's an absolute legend. Um, and uh, I did the one song, and then I remember I was down in um, Cabo San Lucas with friends, and then I got a phone call from Gary Overton, who was running Sony at the time. And he was like, I want you to come to Nashville. I want to hang with you and talk to you a little bit because I think we want to get you to finish the Jake record. And I'm like, well, damn, okay. That was pretty exciting for me, kind of a big get. Um, so I flew back, sat with Gary. Um, we had a great meeting, and then it was decided that we would – We'd finish off the record, and um, Barefoot Blue Jean Night wasn't a part of that at the time. We'd kind of cut four or five songs, used up his budget, um, and at the very end, the last day in the studio, Jake shows up and he's playing this demo. He's like, "What do you think of this song?" And we're all like, "This is awesome. This is great." But we've spent all your money. <laughs> I don't know how we're going to pull this off. And uh, we went back to the label, tried to get an extra, few extra grand to go get a band and cut this song. And we couldn't get it. Like he was, oh, they said no to the they, money? They were like, uh, you've got, I think they said, you've got $2,700 left. And we're like, okay. And that was what was left in his recording budget for that album cycle. And he had some other great songs on the record, so it wasn't like we were panicking, going like, oh, man, we need the, we need the silver bullet. Um, so uh, we decided to just build it, like make computer music, like make you build a beat. And we had enough money in the budget to hire one musician, and I hired one guy out of his band, and... and uh, had Rodney Clausen sing the harmonies, and it's me and my Pro Tools guy and Rodney doing the whoa, doing all that. I think I'm playing some guitar and bass on it. Like, we just put it together, um, and uh, it kind of created this weird little programmed sound, track sound that wasn't a band. And uh, it was one of the, I mean, it, it totally opened the door for me here in Nashville. Um, wow, what a, how many times, though, does it happen where somebody goes, this is a song? Because it feels like every single was the last. And I know it's not true, but Lady A, everybody has a massive song that they were like, yeah. you know, we were done with the record. Yeah. And, they, yeah. and we found this song on the ground walking in. Yeah. It was a scratched up CD, and we only played for three seconds, but we had a feeling that was the three seconds we needed. <laughs> it's, it feels like that's a lot where people come in last minute and try to get a song on. Yeah. yeah. What, do a lot of them not get on, and those are, are dead stories that could have been the greatest story of all time? Um, well, you definitely get pitched a lot of songs. I just, I just had my last three days with Morgan in the studio and man, we were getting pitched a ton of songs. Oh, I can only imagine. It was, yeah. it was terrifying. I'm going, Oh no. <laughs> Cause they're coming. To, it's, it's everyone's hail Mary. So it's their best shot that they've done that month. And you know, there's, we actually ended up cutting a few of them that came in. We just had to. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, we try to cut everything that sounds good. We try to make the exception to just, if it's great, we just find a way to finish it off. But you know, there's probably tons of cir circumstances where the, the great, the great ones go unfound. That last one, though, like a lot of people come in and you know we were done with the record. We were day over. It was the last song. Why is that? Is it because it's the new shiny thing and people are so passionate about it because they just heard it? That's a huge part. Yeah, a lot of a lot of great songs get lost because the artist will move on. It'll get old. Like when the kids write, you know, if we just release a record and they start writing new music, 
that first step will never get out. <laughs> There'll be amazing songs, and we'll just be sitting there going, no, 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 hold on, this is still really good. <laughs> but then they'll just move on and want to pitch the song because they've written something else that they think is cooler. Do you ever listen to old stuff that you've done just in Nashville? Because I'll listen to old jokes I've told on stage or bits that I've done on the radio, and I'm like, oof, man, I'm a lot better than that now. If you were to listen to Barefoot Blue G9, just sit and listen, would you go, that's what I'm talking about? Or would you go, oh, I've actually learned a lot of things since then, and I would do it a little differently now? I always feel shame when I hear them. It's, a, it's I, like I feel shame all the time hearing anything I've ever done. <laughs> yeah. But you, you do. <laughs> oh yeah, it takes me a long time to forget every step of the way. It's usually I don't know. Eighteen months later, I can hear it and go, "Oh yeah, that's cool." When you don't hear every edit or every decision you made in the whole song, or... do you get in the middle of it? Because I'll do this in writing and go, "I don't know if this is good anymore." Because you spent so long inside of it that you now just have to go on instinct instead. At times, of... you really have to fight that because the. Because my job is to just always be the answer guy. No, that's it. We're doing this. Go. And this, I'm like the doubt killer. <laughs> but secretly inside, you're like, I don't, I don't know, man. I don't <laughs> yeah. know. Uh, whenever you record Cruise, because that, again, was another one of those songs that kind of turned the industry mm -hmm. on its ear. Mm -hmm. I wasn't in Nashville yet, but I, even I remember it, mostly because it crossed over, mm -hmm. right? Because that's how big Cruise got. Like, as you're recording that song, because you recorded so many songs. Is, do, do you feel it then? You're like, oh, my God, this one could be monster. That one felt pretty special. It was pretty, it just, I don't know how to describe it. It felt so obvious. Uh, um, it just had a lot of boxes checked. And even if if it gets stuck in my head, I'm pretty jaded. And I, I tend to, uh, I can be pretty, have a pretty cynical outlook on, on all of it just because I do it so much. And if it gets stuck in my head and breaks through all of the other songs I'm working on, it's usually a pretty good sign. And, um you know, we were all walking around singing that song just while we were working on it. We're pretty excited about it. And you weren't surprised by the success? Um, I was really surprised at how fast things happened. Like, you can never guess it's going to be like that. That was a full lightning in a bottle moment. Um, but you, you'd, we knew it was going to do something. You just had no idea it was going to be that, mm. you know. Yeah. It was uh, crazy. That one was wild. Uh, you and Morgan, I mean, you guys did whiskey glasses together. Yep. And so that relationship, because, again, it's not like you and Morgan just got together now. You've been working together for a while. What was it like with Morgan as a new artist when he was signed over at Big Loud initially? Man, that, um, I remember the day he, it felt like he just walked off the street into my studio. And we're like, who is this kid? And the skinny, long-haired kid at the time. And he brought his, uh, his main collaborator. And uh, I think it was a guitar player's band at the time. And they sat in my studio and played a bunch of, songs that he'd written, and you're like, okay, wow. I mean, for a guy who's just had no frame of reference and no exposure to great songwriters, these are pretty good shape, you know? He understood songwriting. But his ability to sing was, whew, that floored us. I remember the, he, he sang um, Eric Church's Talladega, and he sang it absolutely perfect. He sang every single lick that Eric did. I remember Seth and I just sort of looked at each other and we were like, holy crap, our jaws were dropping. And uh, and you could just tell Morgan didn't really understand how good he was. He hadn't been exposed to other people at the time, and um, there was just an innocence to it, which was mind blowing. Uh, uh, we it was kind of obvious at the time the kid just needed a great song, and he was gonna he was gonna go. And then once he came in and started um, writing, I think one first or second or third right, I think it was the first time he got in with Craig. They wrote uh, "Chasing You" together which has ended up being a huge song. Yeah, I maybe mean, one of my favorites still. From yeah, where... yeah, it's great. And and we kind of sat on it for a little bit because we didn't want to, like, we needed a 20-minute set, so we were trying to go with the energetic songs and, and, and temp more tempo songs, and finally it came around to finishing off his first project, and we we cut that song and right away. You could see it well, as soon as we released it, and he started following the data. That one just started rising the whole time. Who are mm -hmm. you working with right now? Like, who are you in the middle of a project with now? Um... <clears throat> well, now that everyone's back on the road and working, I have, you know, access to the artists Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So I kind of have to whittle away at mm -hmm. everything. Um, but um, I just finished my last three days with uh, Morgan on his new music. I say last three days, but there's always <laughs> great songs that come in. I'm sure there'll be a fire drill sometime here. <laughs> um, and uh, so I got a project on that. I'm finishing up new Earn music, which is really exciting. Uh, we're about to drop a new Hardy record, which is exciting. Um, and then, uh, yeah, once the Morgan record's finished, then it's then it's cleaning up 
I should say cleaning up, but uh, working on all the young kids that we have coming up. I'm really excited about a new girl named Lauren Watkins. I just did three days with her, and she's an incredible talent. Really, really strong pen. It's amazing how she just keeps getting better, and she's 23 years old. It's, it's, it's wild to see how fast her songwriting is developing. And she's got a really original voice, and you know those two things are it's a pretty potent com combination. Made for you's such a good song. Love it. I, yeah. I think what you guys did with it sonically is perfect. Um, how do you judge when to scale a song back? Because I, I would think that making a song simple is probably just as hard as making a song yeah. uh, complex. Mm -hmm. That's a song that I think simplicity actually showcases what the song is saying and the message it's sending. Mm -hmm. Is that an internal struggle you have at times? Uh, yes, it is a challenge like for me personally to, to just stop and let the, let the vocal and let the simplicity, um, I'm getting better at it, but it was originally a really hard thing for me to do. Um, uh, but that song was, it had a pretty strong demo when it came in and it was obviously a song that was going to be about a message and it was an opportunity for Jake to sing in his, you know, full kind of baritone chest voice, which is awesome. Um, um, so it was really about staying away from that, not trying to bury everything in guitar parts and other melodies and stuff. It was uh, the, the writing really did the job on that one. I would feel like, for example, if I go and there's a joke I didn't, and I just accidentally found out it works really well, but I didn't put any time into it. I feel like I'm cheating a little bit if it's just like a, such a, like a low hanging fruit. And I'm like, man, I didn't put much effort into this joke. It kills. So let me just do it. But then I feel like I'm not working hard. And I think my struggle would be like, well, I found this song, and it's very simple. But if I don't put like 94 tracks on it, I just feel like I'm working hard. I, I mean, I went through that phase <laughs> for sure, yeah. But there's equal value in knowing when to not, you know. My, down to the Honky Tonk is like my favorite that wasn't a number one. I love that freaking song. The production yeah. on Down to the Honky Tonk yeah. is A+. Plus. Thank you. I, I mean, I, I, that song was amazing. Again, another uh, group of amazing songwriters, Rodney and Luke Laird on that one. And Luke always has interesting music in every song he writes. He's a talented kid. Um, what, do, what do these guys say about you to work with you? What, what would they say? If I would like were to hit Jake, I'd be like, yo, what is Joey like as a producer? What would he say? <laughs> he might say I'm neurotic or uh, <laughs> I have a strong attention to detail. <laughs> I make him sing the song a lot. <laughs> oh, so you do? You make him sing it a lot? <laughs> Sometimes. Just just in general? Yeah. Um, like there's some directors that will make you go, do it again, do it again, do it again. Yeah. Well, there's... There's value in singers can do a lot of things that um, you can't ask them to do. There's just value in repetition. Their voice will do certain things that I, I wouldn't be able to ask him to make his voice crack that certain way. And it only happens because it was his fifth take and he hadn't drank any water and his voice was dry and it cracked and it sounded really great on that one line, which made the, you know, made it sound more intimate or made him sound more sad or, or, or the opposite, made him sound happier. Um, and those are just things you can't ask people to do, even though you might want it. And if you, when you do ask, you can really shut down a singer's vocal take. You can kind of make them think too much, you know, just trying to keep them in that spontaneous space. So, um, And a lot of that cool magic stuff just comes out of repetition. Just over and over until you break them. That's what I hear. You just <laughs> well, if they don't know the song. They're coming in and going like, you got the lyrics for this? I'm like, uh-oh. Oh, does that happen sometimes? <laughs> yeah. Where they if, it's, if it's like a fresh outside song that they haven't had a chance to, yeah. to practice, we go through this phase where they'll sing it a bunch of times, but it's still just, it just sounds new, you know, and it doesn't sound, it sounds like they're still learning it. Um, so I always try and encourage them to listen to it a lot and practice it. So when they're coming in, we don't have to sing it a million times. <laughs> Can you just listen to music for enjoyment? Um, just pure enjoyment. Sometimes, yeah. Without getting extremely analytical about the year and the technology, how they recorded it. Were they all in the same room? Were they, like, sometimes. I tend to listen to a lot of podcasts and mm. <laughs> Laugh USA in my truck to get away from it. That I understand, because <laughs> I, I get away from music, too, because I'm just in it so much. Yeah. Now, but I'm not in it in it like you are, where you're actually, you can probably separate all of the things just by list All together, you can still go, choo -choo and separate all the sounds. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, there's times, there's certain records which, you know, which you just listen to because they're awesome and you, there's no point in criticizing them. Cause what is your favorite record of all time? Full album. Oh, man. I'm going to give a very generic answer. It's probably uh, 
uh, ACDC Back in Black. I feel like that's for its time is the perfect record, and it's a pretty easy one to listen to. But I don't I don't really have a favorite band or genre. I kind of I don't know if it's melodic and it's catchy and I want it gets stuck in my head. I'll I'll listen to it. I'm not really super selective in that regard. If you're just relaxing though, because I definitely have. Music I will go to because it's comfortable, because I already know it, and I already really like it. Mm -hmm. And there are also times where I'm just listening to music to hear new stuff. But I know I'm going to go John Mayer Continuum or Counting Crows, August and Everything After, or Casey Musgrave. There are these records that I just love and feel comfortable with because it puts me... Mm -hmm. What are those records for you? I love the uh, Fleetwood Mac playlist. I'll go through that Rumors. I'll burn that Rumors record out pretty hard. Um... I listened to a ton of Pink Floyd as a kid, and I'll do that every once in a while. Because you chose it or because your, your parents had it? My, my older brother was mm. playing it. I learned, I got a lot of my musical taste from what my older brother was listening to. Um, yeah, it's records like that. I, I went through a huge ACDC phase before I moved here. It was like the only thing we all listened to, and we would jam it in the studio. And um, uh, But uh, I went through a huge tool phase, and I think that fantastic they have some amazing records what about tool to you is great because i know tool i was a big rock kid alternative yeah. kid and i could probably you know i could do a schism i could do all of it in my mouth right but what i maybe i'm i wasn't in music enough at the time to know what separates tool right. why is tool great for me i i love the musicianship of it all it's it's like super nerd music but it's still really simple um and honestly, I listened to the, when it came to Tool, I was so obsessed with the drums and the guitar playing on it. And I thought what Maynard, doing, what Maynard was doing was awesome, but that wasn't where I went. I was just so, so enamored with the rhythm section and, and their, their decisions in that world where they've changed time signatures and do all this stuff. It's, uh, I just thought it was really cool. And they always have this really dark, I don't know, they have, they've chosen the aesthetic and they really stuck to it and nailed it, right? And so, um, you know. That's 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 one you go to when you're feeling a certain way and you just you want to rock or if you're working out and you want to hear something mean. <laughs> I think people will be surprised to know that, as you said, and I would classify it this way too, that Tool it's kind of nerd music because what they do they they're so specific and so good yeah. and so precise. Yeah. But when you hear Tool, not knowing that it's precision and art, you yeah. just hear. Whoa. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. it, you it, just it, hear the energy. Yeah, the juxtaposition is kind of odd there of mm -hmm. being expert musicians. And just kind of the, the charisma of that music mm -hmm. because it is by it's yeah, it's dark. Yeah, it is. It's tough. <laughs> yeah. it's, you got to be in the right mood. It's yeah, tough. It is. Uh, like I said, it's not on my playlist every single day. Um, but you know, I just go to it every once in a while. On so, Morgan's dangerous album, the double album, you did you not only produced it, but you did background vocals you played some on it as well right do you do that because you're like okay only i'm the one that can get this right i'm how i'm picturing it not not going you're the best ever but going mm -hmm. this is how i'm seeing it and i think only i can pull this off it's honestly it's uh i'm my first instinct is to hand the guitar to somebody a million times better than me but um it's usually that usually happens when i'm just alone with the song and i'll be mixing or or yeah, it usually happens when it's mixing and a new idea happens and Morgan's not there. Or I don't have a guitar player around me. So, um, I mean, it's ugly. It doesn't look pretty, but I'll get a I'll get a I'll get a guitar part out of my hands. And if I can, uh, if it's something in my range, I'll sing a part that I'll hear. And those things usually it's I'll just put an idea down and then go make Morgan sing it or whoever it is singing it. And sometimes they'll be like, no, that sounds good. Leave it in there. Yeah. And you so you do. So and I then do. you get paid as a background singer, too. <laughs> <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> when you produce a record like like the Morgan one that's been the biggest record ever, you know, yeah. uh you get points on that, right? Yeah. So so you continue to get paid. Yeah. Golly. I'm kidding. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Between that record, because maybe you haven't even been paid fully on that one in the nickelback stuff. You make more money off this Morgan stuff? Well, yes. Oh, oh, that's all you got to say. I'm good. That's it. <laughs> yeah, but my business structure is a lot different. Now. Oh, I own, man. The, I own the record company. Oh, I hear you, though, but, man, that's <laughs> awesome. What's the idea behind Big Loud Mountain? Big Loud Mountain? Yeah. That was the um, – we've changed all the names now. To, it's just Big Loud now. We've, 
we, wasn't that like a, a one stop kind of deal for new like or explain what the idea was when we there. first came when I when we first just formed our, our our businesses to to do whatever we planned on doing um, that was the name of the publishing company that we put our artists on got it and now it just exists within big loud yeah so shirt all the shirts terming out and and, it, and it's just it's just all going to be big loud you ever had anybody in your studio that you are kind of like, I cannot believe this is happening right now. I'm producing blank. You're like, I don't, I'm going to play it cool. And they're going to think I'm totally just being Joey, normal dude. But you're like, holy crap. Oh, man. I feel like I got really spoiled making the, the last two Hicks tapes for Hardy. I, f- I feel like I covered the entire town. Mm, <laughs> with know? everybody coming now in. Now everybody's yeah. come in. And they, you know, I was, the cool, some of the cooler ones were, uh, of course, you know, anytime you get to sit in a studio with Ronnie Dunn, that's amazing. He's the best. Yeah, I mean, this, this, he still it sounds like it's mm-hmm. the late '80s, early '90s when he sings. It's insane how good of a singer he is. Um, but Joe Diffie came through. That was so cool to get to to hang with Joe Diffie. Tracy Lawrence came through. Um, and that's then, like, it's like all the people from when I was a kid. And like the Ronnie, yeah. the Ronnie thing's awesome. Ronnie and I have formed a friendship, and we go to dinner and stuff. And I, there are times where I'm normal friend but there are times where i'm like this is freaking ronnie dunn yeah yeah like i try to be as normal as possible but it's like yeah. a lot of my childhood was in a small town in arkansas yes listening to every song on the brooks and it doesn't matter the tape it was a tape, tape i remember the when yeah. the first time i heard bird boot scoot and boogie or, mm-hmm. or neon moon you what this is yeah. great <laughs> so i imagine it's pretty hard to get you to if i were to just move to town it'd be hard to get you to do anything for me um production wise you're probably pretty booked out pretty booked out for how long uh, I mean, 2040. What about like in 2041? It's kind of it's kind of for an infinite amount of time. It's hard when your 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 producer career turned into a record company that's a publishing company and a management company. It's, so you're kind of just I'm kind of locked into any of the artists that we sign. And do you and spend it, a lot of time strategizing as well, or because again you have such a I wouldn't even say dual role because it's more than two things, true role, quad role. You have so many roles that you're doing. What do you find that you are the best at, just naturally? And what has been the the hardest part of it for you as an executive? Um, I am one hundred percent a producer by trade. I'm a studio introverted studio rat all day long. That's my strength. I'm the executive side of things. That responsibility falls heavily on Seth. He's uh, I, I'm always there to help out at thirty thousand feet. But when it comes to being the CEO and, and who the executives answer to, that that has to be Seth. That's you have to have a real clean chain of command in that scenario. Um, so myself, Seth, and Craig, we counsel regularly together. But the chief messenger in the building is Seth, and so that allows you know Craig to squirrel away in his room and 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 be the badass songwriter he is, and then that allows me to stay in uh, record producer and our space, song space, you know. Um, and uh, I, I, I spend the majority of my time in the studio with the artists doing that. Got two more things for you. Okay. First one I'm going to ask about Morgan a little bit in that this new project you're working on, what's different? What's the same? You don't have to be super specific. Obviously, I wouldn't want you to do that. But what, I don't know, give me something here. What did you guys uh, decide were going to be the priorities? Um... I feel like the songwriting is great. Again, he's um, he's continu- it's it's always mind blowing how he continues to grow as a songwriter. Um, he's written a ton of this record. Um, you know, we clearly there's a, a little lane has opened with the more progressive sounding songs with songs with beats on it, right? Like "Wasted on You" and "You Proof." So we've done a couple of those, um, and we've stuck to some of the more country sounding songs like we've, we've kind of done the it's 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 evolved and there's kind of some new musical spaces we've gone into but at the same time we've stayed true to what the fans like and we've we've uh we've stayed to things we know they're gonna like and then we've tried a couple new things that we hope they're gonna like any features um not at the moment well, you can ask me once we get off, and I'll do a couple. If you need me to go and do drop I was, a couple, I don't, honestly, I don't mind. that was my agenda A. But yeah, but I'll wait until we're done podcast. here. We'll, we'll get it off. <laughs> we'll, we'll get off this. Uh, so, okay. Well, there's my Morgan question. Is it a lot of songs? 
Um, yet to be determined, but it's Pro- probably a lot of songs. Yeah. You got's got to be. You have to. You can't set us up like that with all those songs last time and then be like, well, here's just a half a cup. Yeah, here's now. an EP, guys. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah. No, we've uh, the there's Morgan is in the sweet spot right now. The 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 town is empowered around him. A lot of the writers really like writing with him. Um, and so there's a lot of songs coming our way. Okay, that's all I need there. What? Uh, what's the goal? Here we are today. It's middle of November. This may be a couple weeks before it even gets on the air. But here you are, 2023. You've you've done everything as far as at, at the height. Meaning musically, I don't know anybody in town who can just go definitively go. Yeah, I'm better enjoying more. They can't. They can't. <laughs> now I'm not saying you're saying that either. But I'm saying, what well, what is there to do? that you haven't done yet that is still exciting to you? Uh, my favorite is still making first records. That's the most exciting time. Um, when you're building that frame of reference with a young artist, you're watching their eyes just pop out of their head every corner they turn around or every phase of the process. Um, I love making new uh, styles of music within the genre and seeing if they work and then learning from the release and pivoting if we need to. So artist development has always been rewarding for as long as I've been doing this. I, I, I love it. It's my favorite. Um, and I, I just want to continue to do that. I want to, uh, I'm really, I've never had success with a female artist. I want to do that. Um, and uh, we've launched our rock label and I'm studying. Who, who's on the rock label? Uh, we have a group by the name of Blame My Youth. Um, we have another group. We've put some of Hardy's record out through the rock label. Um, and we have another individual by the name of Jaguar Twin. It's all really alternative rock-based. Um, we just signed some new kids called Yam House. Uh, we have another guy by the name of uh, Let Down. He's more... Uh, it's also what my family called me. Let Down? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Stole that from me. <laughs> they, they title every Christmas card, Dear Let Down. <laughs> do, do you feel like there's a resurgence coming? I hope so. I, I've been listening to a lot of Alt Nation these days, a lot mm-hmm. of just me alternative too. rock. Mm-hmm. I, 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 I'm, I don't know why it's inspiring to listen to. I feel like they've, it's really changed from you know vintage keyboard music to it's kind of coming back into mainstream, four chords, lots of good hooks, lots of melody, kind of good literal lyrics. You're seeing it really... It's really been moving over the last 18 months. That genre has, I think it's, for me personally, it's probably changing the most right now. And you're starting to see things leak over into the larger genres. So um, I'm hoping that trend follows. And, you know, eventually people get fatigued of computer music and they like hearing bands again. So It's know. all cyclical, right? Yeah, totally. Everything. It'll come back around. You're, I mean, you're, you're hearing it already. There's, there's, there's pop punk on top 40. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And there's, there's guitars and drums and stuff that are, that are coming back. So it's going to come back in some form. So Might as well be you. Yeah, I would, I would love it. I've, I would love to have one of those things on the rock label to do really well or break or at least start to get noticed. Because some of them are doing good. They're, you know, As long as you're seeing those ticket sales increase and the merch increase and the streaming increase, you know, you're, you're heading in the right direction. Yeah, let's get you another Maserati. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I don't even own a Maserati. Let's get you another Maserati. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> My, um, I, I will end with this. I, th- what I was thinking about, and I was just kind of looking through some notes about some of the stuff that you've done and just looked through the catalog. I think one of my favorite songs, and this is going to be really douchey because I didn't see it written. Did you do, you did all the Hardy stuff, right? Yeah. The, the mixtape. Yeah. The, the, uh, he went to Jared. Or, oh, yeah. He, that's like my, I think that's my, that be my, might be my favorite. The thing that I see that you have done that I'm like, God dang. <laughs> like, like just, when I hear that song, I go, that's different, that's good, yeah. that makes me feel so, not sad or happy, but it's just like, first time I heard it, I was like, man, that is it. You, you can, when you, even, even now, even I can hear that stuff and I can hear that we had so much fun making that music. Like it is, it is, it is in the box, but it's outside the box, like all the hard yeah. stuff. It is, and him and I bond over that 2000s Pacific Northwest rock scene, you know, the Stone Temple Pilots and the Soundgarden and the Alice in Chains, um, all of that active rock that we all kind of grew up on. Um, yeah, as important as the songwriting, just sonically, like the, it, those two, it just, yep. it's just like the, the perfect couple. Yep. The music, the lyrics, 
uh, the guitars. Yeah. The big, I mean, all the big drum fills. Yeah, all the old big rock fills. It's like arena rock meets country music. Meets, meets Hardy. Just yeah. Hardy because there's, no, there's nobody like him. And it really works live. It's almost we almost think more about the live show than we do streaming and and, and radio. On yeah, I saw him songs. come out and do that. He shot out from the ground. I, I went to Morgan's show, and we had missed the early part. We got we missed Hardy, and it was a whole disaster getting over there. But then we get there and. He shoots up from under the stage, and they do the song, and I was like, "Oh, I got to hear my song, my song." Yeah. So anyway, great job. You don't oh, need to hear me you. say great job, but oh, thank you. those uh, the two Maseratis that you drove, the one, and, and your assistant drove beside you in that's case right. you wanted to switch halfway. <laughs> I like. That. I'm bored of this car. Yeah, Pull over. Really... <laughs> <laughs> uh, just congratulations. Thank you. Very Super much. excited to finally meet you. Uh, I've you heard too. about you for so long, and. Just really cool, and I appreciate the time you spent with me here today. Uh, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. It's been right. fun. There he is, Joy Moy.